Welcome to the Boardwalk Talks program brought to you by the Alabama Aquarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab and this morning we are chatting with Dr. Ben Titus who studies symbiosis and today he's going to talk with us about uh, symbiotic relationships between clownfishes and their sea anemone hosts and what we um, may be able to uncover about uh, the, the sea anemone hosts and their role in this symbiosis. So with that, I am going to let Dr. Titus tell you a little bit about okay. this. All right, thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here. Um, this is my first Boardwalk Talk um, as a faculty member at Dauphin Island, so excited to be uh, able to talk about my research program a little bit. So I have a number of slides that I'll just walk through um, hopefully pretty quickly, and then we can chat about any questions you guys have and, and my research program. But um, like the title implies, uh, we are going to be talking about the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis, and specifically what we can learn from the sea anemone hosts themselves, which happen to be the most understudied part of the symbiosis, and as we'll see, um, hold the key to understanding the actual evolutionary history and radiation of the entire symbiosis. So um, I'll just give you a quick background on me. Um, my research program is, is focused on this question of how does biodiversity evolve within symbiotic relationships. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit briefly about the, just the importance of symbiosis broadly um, and just to point out specifically that everything is symbiotic and basically life on the planet as we know it could not exist without symbiotic interactions. So even people have symbiotic gut bacteria that allow us to digest certain foods. Um, all the fruit you eat is because of the symbiosis between plants and pollinators. Um, this is it's kind basically of a fresh, everywhere. Fresh perspective because yeah. we have traditionally identified these very specific relationships that we uh, term symbiotic. Yeah, exactly. But it's more broad than that. It's much more broad. So, you know, we think of from a symbiosis perspective, a lot of times we think about like a mutualism. Mm -hmm. So symbiosis is a sort of umbrella term just talking about living together, things that live together in this intimate relationship. Um, and within that umbrella, then we can have like a mutualistic relationship where both partners benefit. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But you could also have a parasitism where one partner benefits and the other partner is hurt. A hurt. So that's also a symbiosis. But it's basically everywhere. Um, and so because it's everywhere, it's obviously been very important for all of life. Um, and so the question remains is like, how important is it in terms of like generating all of life? So if everything needs to be in a symbiotic relationship to basically survive, how did that symbiosis generate the amount of biodiversity that we see today? And there's a little bit of nuance there because just because you're symbiotic doesn't mean that that species is the result that it evolved because of the symbiosis itself. So if you had two popul if you had a population of symbiotic organisms that happened to be split and isolated from each other, given enough time, they could evolve into two separate species. Um, but they would have evolved because of another factor rather than their symbiosis. So it's a pretty complicated dance when we think about these interactions, and it's quite fascinating given how important symbiosis is broadly to all of life, and this is sort of what motivates my research program. Um, that's a very grandiose way to explain symbiosis, um, and I'm interested in this question primarily on coral reefs and these interactions between sea anemones and, and their symbionts. And so you can see some of the species that I work on here. Um, I've worked a lot in the Caribbean, so on these cleaner shrimp that live on sea anemones, and they form cool interactions with reef fish. They remove parasites. And then right now I'm working primarily in the Indian and Pacific Oceans on the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis. And to just give you a little bit of a flavor of what I do specifically, um, I have a video from the Maldives from a few years back um, just to kind of show you the general progression of maybe a day in the field since, you know, I can't bring you all to the Maldives with me, unfortunately. So I was here with a collaborator of mine, Chris Meyer, from the Smithsonian, and uh, we were there to collect sea anemones for my research and cowries for his research. Um, so every day basically just starts by loading up the boat and heading out and finding a spot to dump over the side. Um, and it's sort of an embarrassment of riches when you're working in the Maldives. You just kind of pull up to these remote, amazing little islands. 
and then just dump over the side of the boat and then you just basically go on a big scavenger hunt. So, when you say dump over the side of the boat, you mean yourself. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you have your, have your tank on. Just for those not familiar with that lingo. Exactly. You just roll backwards um, and then you basically go on a big scavenger hunt for the animals that you're after. And so you'll see, you know, we kind of have to work with hand signals because you can't talk clearly <laughs> underwater. Um, and you're limited to about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how deep you're going. Um, it's one of the challenges of actually working underwater is you're limited um, by the amount of air that you have and how much nitrogen your body's accumulating. And um, so you gotta really make it count. So some of these trips, you gotta spend two or three weeks um, to collect the number of samples that you really need for your research. And you can see here too, we basically go underwater with a bunch of bags and cameras. Um, once you find the anemone and what you're looking for here, you can see it down on the sort of center middle of your screen. We take a bunch of notes. We're interested in the size of the anemone. Um, we're interested in the species of fish or other crustacean symbionts that occur with the anemone. Um, and sometimes there might be more than one anemone present. And so we're interested in how many anemones might be present in a cluster. Um, so we write all that information down. And then what I basically am after is after genetic samples. And so I just am mostly clipping a tentacle off of the anemone itself. Um, occasionally, these fish are a little skittish here, but occasionally the fish will just come and bite your hands. So clownfish are not nice. Um, they're quite aggressive and territorial. So they're protecting the anemone. Exactly, so they do. <laughs> they actually, we'll have a slide here in a second about that. They, so they actually protect the anemone itself. And um, so they take a few different samples and then you just move on to the next, next anemone. We also use these underwater bags called whirl packs. So if you've met with any of the other biologists here at the Sea Lab, it's a very common way to collect. You can label it. Um, and then you go back to the lab and then you just sit there and you process your samples. So at the end of a long day, you've potentially got dozens and dozens of samples that you need to preserve and label. And sometimes this takes long into the night. Um, when you're back from the field, then you can actually go through the, some, some of the molecular wet lab stuff. So extracting DNA, getting it prepared for, for sequencing. Um, and at this point, we mostly send our sequencing, um, our samples off to be sequenced rather than sequencing anything on site. So we send them to these core labs. Um, but this kind of gives you a progression over a few weeks of what that looks like. So you get some really fun stuff and then you have to come back to the lab. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so that's just sort of a basic rundown of what I do. Um, We'll skip that. Um, and now we're gonna dive into the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis itself. And just to provide some basic background, like I mentioned, Mendel and I were talking about, it is a mutualism. It means both parties are benefiting from this relationship. Um, my guess is most of you realize that the clownfish are getting protection from the anemone. So sea anemones are venomous animals. They're related to jellyfish and they have stinging cells. Uh, they eat fish and other prey items. So if a normal fish just comes a little too close, they'll just grab it and drag it into its mouth. Uh, they're close relatives of corals, um, except they're just one big polyp instead of lots of thousands of mini little polyps. Um, but the sea anemone is getting benefits too. Like we mentioned, they're aggressive, so the fish will chase off other sea anemone predators like butterfly fish. Um, sea turtles will eat sea, will, will eat sea anemone, so they'll come up um, and you'll see the clownfish go straight for the, for the eyes of the turtle. Um, the other less glamorous way that the fish benefit the anemones is that they are defecating into the anemone itself. So they're, they're dumping nitrogenous waste directly into the anemone. One of the, reason the water is, uh, one of the reasons the water is so clear in the tropics is because it doesn't have nutrients in it. So it's very nutrient poor, which makes the water very clear. So that's an important source of nitrogen for the sea anemone is this clownfish waste byproduct. 
So let's just expand on that for yeah. just a second because yes. it's nitrogen poor, the, the connection, because you said that the water is clear, is so that there's not a lot of algae in the water that's fed by the... Correct. ...by the uh, nutrients. Yeah, exactly. So the water's so warm, any nutrients that do get sort of pumped in sinks to the bottom, and then there is a very well-developed thermocline in the tropics. So what that means is that you have the top layer of water, which is really warm, and then you have a bottom layer of water, which is really cold. And cold water is dense, and warm water is less dense, and so it stratifies the surface water. And what ends up happening is because it's always warm all year round, that never breaks down. And so it never gives an opportunity to mix. So all the nutrients just sink to the bottom and they stay there. Whereas here in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance, this time of year, the water is about 20 degrees colder than it will be in the summer. And so you get a breakdown of the thermocline and what that allows is this water to mix and it pulls that nutrient water, nutrient rich water up to the surface. And then when it gets warm again, you get these big algal blooms, which is why the water looks green. But in the tropics, you don't, you don't get that. So it's one of the reasons it's clear and, you know, one of the reasons that the nitrogen is so important for the, uh, the sea anemone from the clownfish itself. And uh, you did mention that um, anemones are uh, animals. Uh. Yes, yes, an important point. So sea anemones are animals. They are relatives of jellyfish and very close relatives of corals. So they belong to this class called anthozoa, which means flower animal. Uh, they're benthic, so they just sit on the bottom. They don't swim around. Um, they're not fixed to the bottom like maybe a coral would be because they have this hard skeleton. So they could maybe move around a little bit, but once they find like a happy spot, they're just gonna hang out. They're not gonna be exploring too much. Um, and so we often think of this um, nitrogen, we just mentioned it as a benefit to algae. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, so can you explain how the um, nitrogen is, why it's so beneficial to the anemones? Yeah, so another layer, I was trying to keep it simple, but um, <laughs> another layer to the symbiosis is that like a lot of tropical coral species, the sea anemones also host algae within their tissues. So in addition to eating fish, they can also get almost 100% of their sort of like energy requirements from um, the photosynthetic byproduct of the algae that live in their tissues. So the algae are gathering sunlight, photosynthesizing, and then they're passing off that sugar to the, to the anemone itself. And so that nitrogen is essentially fertilizing the algae that live in the tissues of the anemone and making the algae very happy and then makes the anemone happy. So. There's a lot going on here beyond just a simple one-to-one -one relationship. And then you have a whole layer of uh, the microbes that live on it as well. But the, the algae is an important component. Um, you can see here, um, I singled this species of clownfish out specifically because this is the one we all know from Finding Nemo. Um, it belongs to um, Amphiprion ocellaris, which is called the false clown anemone fish or the ocellaris clownfish or the, just the false clownfish, lots of different common names. Um, but the clownfish symbiosis is a lot more diverse than I think most people realize. So Finding Nemo just really kind of highlighted one species. Um, in fact, there are 28 different species of clownfish or anemone fish. And you can see that there's a lot of variation in the color and the pattern and the types <coughs> of stripes that exist. And this is where the sort of mystery behind the symbiosis begins because there are a lot of species that have evolved in a very short period of time. So this is, you know, these are simplified, but these yes. do represent actual like um, color colorations and patterns for the 28 different species. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So if you see a fish that looks like this, and mm -hmm. this might be Amphiprion sandaracinos or Pacificus, I can't remember which one specifically, um, it has no stripes. It just has a dorsal stripe running down the, the back of its body. Um, so you can see some of them are sort of this creamsicle color with no stripes. Some of them, you know, we have two here that are kind of the classic Finding Nemo pattern, but then you have ones that are black with multiple white stripes. Some are just black, some are just almost this reddish orange with no stripes at all. So there's quite a lot of variation 
um, that exists across these different species. And what's the distribution for this worldwide? Well, very good question because the next slide <laughs> is exactly that. So they are distributed um, in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And you can see that it's quite complex um, in terms of which species live together. So some places in sort of the edge of the range, you might only get one species. Um, French Polynesia only has one. But like in the center of the range, um, it's quite densely packed. You might have up to 10 to 12 different clownfish species all living on the same, in the same basic geographic area. And that creates a lot of competition for different host sea anemones. So um, if you're looking at this image, some of these are kind of blown up, but you can see that they are pointing to a particular geographic region. So if you were looking at that sort of um, to kind of get an idea of the um, latitude span, um, that might give you a false sense of, of these being in the higher latitudes. Yeah. But these are, would they mostly be restricted to the tropics? Yep, exactly. So um, you do get some species that can bleed into like some warm subtropical waters, but everything is almost exclusively confined to the tropics, um, just like corals. You can get some interesting things happening at the high latitudes. Um, <laughs> I had some collaborators in Japan send me pictures of just fields of anemones with no fish that are up near Tokyo, and then you'll see little fronds of kelp interspersed. So you can get some really interesting distributions at some of these high latitudes, but like the bulk of it is confined to the tropics and, and warm water. And so these 28 different species live with 10 different species of sea anemone hosts. Mm. And so it's not just one host. Um, this represents um, just a fraction of the sea anemone diversity that would potentially exist on a reef. These happen to be the largest anemones. Um, whether they're large because they have the sea anemone uh, clownfish in them or whether they have the clownfish in them because they're large you know we don't know that Still you know chicken and an egg thing nature. exactly i think there might be some co-evolution going on but can you give us an idea of the diversity of sea anemones so there are 10 that have clownfish associations yep. known but um uh, give us an idea of how many there are just so we know how many don't have clownfish associated. Yeah, so worldwide, I want to say there are currently like 1,500 um, sea anemone species. And anemones have an interesting distribution. They're actually less diverse in the tropics than they are in the subtropics, which is the opposite pattern that you get for almost every single organism on the planet, which is more diverse in the tropics than they are in the subtropics. So it actually is a a very interesting group biologically because of that distribution. Um, but, you know, there could potentially be hundreds of species in the tropics that don't host clownfish. Um, but these are, these are the 10 that do. They've only been morphologically described. And in fact, most of my research right now is focused on doing all the genetics for these 10 species to figure out if there's actually more diversity there than sort of meets the eye. And so we're using hmm. genetics to find and describe new cryptic species of, of host sea anemones. And the, I mean, is there a relatively high confidence that this is approximately the number of anemone species that host clownfish? Or would you expect that there might be some of these relationships that have not been discovered yet? Yeah, most, I would say, okay. based on some of the preliminary data that I've collected, which I actually don't have here, I bet this number is going to at least double. And that would be based on not necessarily discovering a, a, a new anemone, but, but discovering that some of these anemones have, it, it represents more than one species? Exactly, yes. Okay. So, you know, one of the classic examples that I give are giraffes. Um, giraffes are described as a single species, but when you look at the genetics of giraffes across Africa, they are split up into about five or six different very distinct genetic groups. The vertebrate world loves to designate these as subspecies. Um, in the invertebrate world, we don't deal with subspecies quite as much. Um, but what that basically shows is that these different subspecies of giraffes are split by one or two million years. So they're very different animals. Um, and we're going to see the same thing with the sea anemones. Now, sea anemones have a lot of issues from a morphological standpoint because they don't have hard parts. 
So there's not a lot of physical, there are not a lot of physical features that we can use to tell these things apart. But when you start to look at the DNA, you can start to see that, wow, these are really, really distinct and they might have evolved two, three, maybe 10 million years divergence time um, in between these cryptic species. Um, the bubble tip anemone is one that I've worked on maybe the most. Um, and we know that that one probably has at least four different cryptic species just within this one currently described species. Mm -hmm. So there might be four alone just from that. Um, Could they so, be living kind of like a colony where the, um, the individuals are not necessarily easy to discern? So one individual can asexually reproduce and then you can get a big cluster of genetically identical mm -hmm. anemones. But we have not seen two different maybe cryptic species forming a cluster. So they just look so similar that they had previously be, been identified as a single species, but exactly. you are finding that there may be multiple species that look enough alike that they... Yeah, okay. yep, exactly. So indistinguishable from the naked eye. So this is sort of like my current research project that I have going on in the lab is, is doing the molecular stuff on, on these guys. Um, and I showed you that slide with the 28 different clownfish species. So there's a lot of interaction here and it makes it quite complex and researchers have been trying to sort of like solve this complexity for decades at this point. And so before DNA sequencing for the fish, um, all you have to go off of is the morphological characteristics. So you have the physical features and the color and the pattern and they grouped the different 28 species based on those features into these complexes. So we have things called the skunk complex and the tomato complex and all these essentially are are just evolutionary hypotheses about relationships, what are closely related, right? If things look very similar, that probably means they're more closely related because not as much evolutionary time has passed for big changes to occur. Um, and so these were the sort of pre-DNA sequencing um, hypotheses about relationships among the 28 species of clownfishes um, and then molecular uh, DNA sequencing comes along and totally flips everything on its head. So the first major phylogeny that was built was in 2012 and you can see that it basically shows that none of those relationships are really accurate. The color pattern is scattered across the tree. And so um, this was really confusing to a lot of people. You have you know these black and white species scattered up and down. You have these sort of like skunk clownfishes scattered up and down. You have um, these sort of reddish ones scattered across the tree. Well, could you give kind of a brief ex explanation of the tree, what that tree represents? Yes, so the tree is, this is a phylogenetic tree and it represents the relationships, the evolutionary relationships among the different species. So they're connected. So each species here that's listed at the ends of the tree, um, we call these terminals. They are connected at these sort of joints or nodes in the tree and it's basically showing this is a close relative. The, cl the shorter the branch, the closer relative you would have. And then they connect back in time as you go. And what, one of the things that you can see about this tree is that the clownfish evolved very rapidly. So 25 of the 28 species evolved in just the last 5 million years and that's really rapid. And so to see that sort of rapid evolution combined with the fact that the fish look so different and there seems to be no rhyme or reason for the color pattern scattered throughout the tree was really confusing and it has created some major headaches in just trying to understand how the whole symbiosis has evolved and why these fish look so different and why these different color patterns have evolved multiple times across the whole radiation. Um, and so let's just, yeah. let's just cover this too. Let's cover yes. Um, <laughs> so there's not, I mean, um, just because this may be a question some folks have, there's not much variation in a particular species on this coloration and pattern. This is consistent through a species. Basically, yes. Yeah, exactly. So if you come across, you know, if you find something in the wild that looks like, you know, Amphiprion nigripes, this happens to be an endemic species to the Maldives, for instance. All of those species basically look identical. 
Um, so there's not, there's not a whole lot of variation within a species. So it's, it's actually, you're able to tell them apart fairly easily. Yeah. Um, so this sort of begs the question then, like what is actually going on and what is the key variable that kind of explains the evolution of this group? And so one of the things that has been studied um, quite extensively is this association between the fish and the sea anemones. And maybe the sea anemones can disentangle why the fish look the way that they do. Um, and so for decades, people have been going around the Indian and Pacific Oceans and identifying the fish and basically mapping which sea anemone host that it lives in. And it's created this table and it shows you, and this is oh, probably hard to see online, but basically it shows you which fish have been documented living in what sea anemones. And you can see that a lot of the different host um, sea anemones host many different types of fish. And even within one fish species, you can maybe live with four, five, six, some fish species live with, have been documented living with all 10 sea anemone hosts. Hmm. And so after you gather this information, and this is sort of the seminal table that was produced by Daphne Fountain and Gerald Allen in the early 90s, this has been largely unchanged for 30 years. Only about four new associations have been added this, to this table in 30 years. Um, when you map this back onto the tree to start to look for patterns in terms of how did sea anemones impact the evolution of the fish. So at the very base of the tree, we know that the mutualism essentially triggered this evolutionary radiation of, of the fish. So the closest relative to clownfish don't live in sea anemones. So this novel ability to live in sea anemones was very important from an evolutionary perspective and allowed this diversification to occur. But when we map the associations onto the tree, you can clearly see that there is no pattern whatsoever. So it doesn't show us anything clearly. Um, you see you know, anemones that um, host with one fish. You see anemones with these little pie charts that host with, or I'm sorry, anemone fish that host with anemones, maybe one anemone, some that host with seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, no clear pattern has ever emerged um, showing a true linkage between the patterns of host use and the diversification of the clownfish themselves. So these clownfish are almost all in the same uh, genus. And you mentioned that you uh, suspect that you would have at least twice as many species, uh, you know, of, of those 10 anemones yes. that have been identified. Would the, uh, like, um, branches that you discover, would you expect that they would be in the same genus and just different species? For the sea anemones? Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. It's very different. What's going on with the sea anemones is very different than what's going on with the fish. So the fish all belong to the same genus. This one weird one up here, Premnus, was just recently added to the genus Amphiprion, but the sea anemones actually belong to three very distinct groups um, within the broader sea anemone phylogeny, um, and they're not closely related at all. So we don't see the same sort of close evolutionary relationship among the anemones like we do with the fish. And so, I mean, so where would we, are they in different Families or yep. different? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So there. So we have family level differences. Okay. Um, among the three groups. So basically, there. Are but if you were to um, sort of differentiate one that had already been identified as a single species into two different species, would you expect that they would be in the same genus? Exactly. So then you would see this short branch, mm -hmm. like you see here with the fish. So it's possible that the anemones are hiding some really tight relationships that you would kind of see similar to what you're seeing, seeing with the fish here with these short branch lengths that they've evolved within the last million or two years. Um, but the big differences among the sea anemone groups, the family level differences could potentially be, you know, 10, 20 million years or more. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's another thing that we're working on. We have very poor resolution in terms of understanding the relationships among the different th three lineages. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, so in essence here, no pattern is falling out. 
among the sea anemones. Um, and so this is, this kind of bothered me um, primarily because, and I'll go back one slide, I'll show you what I mean. Um, all the anemones are being treated the exact same way when we look at them in this, in this way. So we, we see, okay, Amphiprion, Chrysogaster lives with four different species. And in this phylogeny, we're going to treat them all the same. When in reality, when you're in the field and you're scuba diving and you're seeing these things on a reef, what you're actually seeing is a very different pattern. There are very clear non-random associations that happen. And some fish anemone combinations have, are occurring much more frequently than others. Mm. And some of the anemone hosts will only host juvenile clownfish. And some of the anemone hosts are the only hosts where you actually get reproduction occurring. So there's some important biological things that are going on that show differences. There might be important differences in preference and competition for different hosts. Um, but when you treat everything the same, you're not differentiating, you're not pulling that information out or you're not treating that information in, in maybe a biologically meaningful way. And so... I, I just have another question sure. about how this might be. As you mentioned, resolution, kind of getting a like more detailed picture yeah. here. Um, so from what I know about clownfish and anemones, they have, they, they kind of, kind of the, cl the clownfish kind of stick closely to the anemone. Mm -hmm. um, but do you have cases where they might associate with an anemone on a shorter term for any reason? Like, it's a good question. So typically, typically not. So clownfish are really bad swimmers. And so if they leave their host, they are going to get eaten pretty quickly. And if you're just meandering down a reef, a grouper or a snapper are going to come through and probably eat you almost, almost immediately. And the anemones are not close enough for them to kind of hop from one to another? Exactly. So, well, typically they're not. Typically they're not. There's usually a, quite a bit of space on the reef between anemones. And one of the interesting things about the clownfish that we see from the social groups is that you'll see fish hanging out. So I'll kind of back up. When you get adult clownfish, they are these monogamous breeding pairs. You have one adult male and one adult female that live in an anemone. There can be other fish in this anemone, but those are either juveniles or non-reproductive subadults. And those guys will just hang out around the perimeter of the anemone and they'll chase off fish and they'll you know, help take care of the eggs sometimes. Um, and they're unrelated to the adult breeding pair, and they're just sitting there waiting their turn. So if one of, let's say the female dies, the adult male will transition and become the adult reproductive female. And then there'll be some competition among the fish that are already in the anemone host. And the winner of that competition becomes the adult reproductive male. So there's a lot, the only way to reproduce basically is to get lucky and outcompete your other Subadults, if one of the adult reproductive clownfishes dies. But they um, generally have like a lifelong association with an individual sea anemone? Generally. It's so risky to leave that they've basically resigned themselves, almost like, you know, in a wolf pack, you only have an, you know, a reproductive adult, male and female, and everything else just helps the wolf pack. It's kind of like the same thing to a certain degree in the clownfish. It's so risky to leave that you will just sit there and wait and wait and wait. And one of the things, one of the unique things that clownfish have evolved is an extraordinarily long lifespan. Mm. So clownfish can live for 20 or 30 years, which is staggering considering there are these small damselfish and a normal damselfish will live for a couple years on the reef. And so they've been able to evolve this long lifespan probably because they have this reproductive social structure that means you're going to be waiting for a long time to get your turn. Um, and it's so risky to leave that, you know, they've evolved this ability. It's, it's quite interesting. So, yeah, so they're, they're staying put. They're not migrating around a whole lot. Um, it'd be quite an extreme risk to do that. All right. So... This basically means that there's a lot of layers of complexity to this interaction that are just not being accounted for. And so one of the things that I wanted to do in my research is come up with a way to treat the anemone hosts 
and account for some of this complexity in a more maybe meaningful way. So I came up with this hypothesis, which is that the frequency that a clownfish is actually reproducing in a specific sea anemone will be the most biologically meaningful characteristic for the clownfish host association. So instead of accounting for all the hosts, we're just primarily accounting for the anemones that the fish is known to reproduce in. And what this is doing is it's accounting for all these characteristics. It's accounting for host preference. So there's clear preferences across the different hosts. It's accounting for competition because there's competition among different clownfish species for different hosts. So you could have a fish that even if you prefer one anemone, spe one anemone species, if another fish outcompetes you, it can exclude an entire species from utilizing that host. So that's an important thing to account for. It is the host that they reproduce in. And we also know that those reproductive adults, um, the fish that are in the, the preferred reproductive hosts are experiencing greater growth and they're surviving longer than if you were in a, what's considered maybe like a less preferred non-reproductive host. So this is essentially a way to capture all this biological information um, and eliminating some of the noise by treating all the anemone hosts. So when you said a non-reproductive host, you mean that the clownfish that are in that host are non-reproductive. And you had mentioned that yeah. there are some that only host juveniles. Exactly. So But those juveniles are not going to move to a different host that is Right. So there's been some debate about this in the literature. Um, basically the evidence that exists shows that these are more likely developmental dead ends yeah. than a nursery habitat. So like we said, like if you leave a host and you swim down the reef, the likelihood is you're probably going to get eaten pretty quickly. <coughs> um, so, you know, I guess at some level recruiting to an anemone is better than not recruiting at all. And so they have evolved this ability and they live in some of these non-preferred hosts. But um, you never see adult reproductive pairs in specific species of sea anemones um, for some clownfish species. And so you only, kept, you only catch them in um, you know, their preferred reproductive habitats. Um, and so this is a way to maybe kind of sift through some of that noise. And so I went through and I had data from the field. I have a lot of collaborators all over the Red Sea and in Japan and Australia. I asked them to send me their raw data on these host associations. Um, I went through the literature and then one of the things that I did, which is really fantastic, is I used these biodiversity databases like iNaturalist, which allow people to upload photographs of species that they see, and it allows us as researchers to actually extract some information out of it. So I actually went through thousands of photographs on iNaturalist, and I basically quantified the associations between the hosts and the sea anemone, or the hosts and the clownfish, and basically determined which um, hosts we found adult uh, clownfish in and which hosts that we didn't. And some amazing things popped out. So then we'll go back to this association table. This is the original one. After my original search, um, we found evidence basically confirming most of the original um, Fountain and Allen host association table. Some of it, some of these species, we were unable to sort of independently verify that association. Um, so that's pretty good. I mean, in, you know, between the 80s and the 90s, like they did a really nice job of you know, documenting it. Um, but the staggering thing was that through this process, we found like, direct evidence, either collected by myself or my collaborators, or photographic evidence from these biodiversity databases for 25, 24 new associations across 10 clownfish species. So this is a massive update. And you said that in the previous decades before this work was done, there were like three new ones? Like three new ones over the past 30 years. Um, but being able to leverage digital photography, like these citizen science initiatives, we were able to basically confirm that it's way more complex than we thought. And it's a huge update, which is really exciting. Well, that allows you to access a whole uh, lot of, a much bigger sample size because Huge. you pointed out how time intensive that yeah. is to go and um, collect these samples. And if yeah. you're able to access samples from thousands of people who are right. sharing that information. There's no way 
you could do this yourself. I mean, it's just too big of a range. And um, so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty phenomenal leap in some of the abilities for, these, for biodiversity science. Um, so then when we sort of sift through the noise, when we only look at the fish and the anemones, these interactions where you find adult clownfish species in a specific host, you start to see things start to clear up a little bit. Okay, so then we're going to go back to these trees, and this is a brand new phylogenetic tree. When we pop these associations, these are the old associations treating everything the same, mm -hmm. and then these are the new ones, only focusing on the, on the anemone hosts where they reproduce. And you immediately see a cool pattern start to emerge, and that it is clownfish color and pattern is convergent, and it is being driven by host use. So I'm going to walk through some of these. So basically everything that is this sort of reddish orange base body color. So wait, let's go back for just a second. Each one of the colored circles represents a different anemone. Yes, exactly. Sorry. Yeah, they kind of were linked up here, but I didn't list the species next to it. <clears throat> um, so the blue here is the bubble tip sea anemone and tecmea. Everything that primarily reproduces as a bubble tip specialist is sort of this reddish orange color. And the other thing you'll notice is that they either have reduced number of stripes or if they have multiple stripes, they're very narrow. So it's a clear pattern that starts to emerge across the tree. And you've seen this, this evolves four times across the whole clownfish tree hmm. for the specialists. When we take a look at the other species, Heteractus magnifica, that is this red circle here. You see a similar pattern that everything that primarily reproduces in Heteractus magnifica, and there are a couple, you know, little exceptions here and there because it's nature, um, you get this sort of creamsicle color orange with reduced body or with reduced stripes and reduced stripe width. And then everything else. Is there a, um, um, like a preference? So um, do the anemones that have multiple um, reproductive, I mean the clownfish that have multiple reproductive hosts, is there a preference for one above others? Preference is a little tricky. Um, it's not very well sort of disentangled. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if you take these out of, a, out of the, the wild and you put them in a tank, they'll live with anything. But then you put them in on, on a reef and all these patterns kind of emerge. So preference is a little bit, is a little bit tricky. Um, there might be for some of them, but I don't, it hasn't been studied all that closely. Um, but basically for the rest of these, we call these reproductive generalists. And the sort of common denominator here is that um, they, they'll reproduce in the bubble tips and they'll reproduce in Heteractus magnifica, the other two anemones. But the common denominator is that these are reproducing in these carpet anemones as well. So these big giant, they look like shag carpets that just sort of drape over the reef. Um, they'll reproduce in, in these carpet anemones and they're black with multiple white stripes. And you'll see here some of them, these black with multiple white stripe species, you know, you can get some carpet anemone specialists kind of thrown into this group too. Um, but by and large, if you're black with multiple white stripes, you can host and reproduce in lots of different species. Hmm. And so this is really exciting because for the first time, what we're seeing is we're actually explaining the color pattern variation. So this was these sort of observational correlative, correlative data that we then went through and conducted some more quantitative statistics on to actually confirm that this pattern that we're seeing has the most explanatory pow power of, of anything else. So we can control for things like phylogenetic relationships, color pattern, and, and, that's, and so forth. Um, and this sort of really nice color pattern um, really just falls into place. And so it's quite exciting um, because this has been a long-standing mystery. Um, and then we can start to answer some questions about, you know, how symbiosis has affected the entire radiation. We have mutualism triggering the sort of adaptive radiation itself. But then we can start to see some interesting patterns here where things like host specialization led to diversification events. Um, and interestingly, there really only appear to be three species 
that are alive today that evolve from purely these sort of like host switching or specialization events. Um, so it doesn't seem like we have time to dive into that, which is totally fine. But um, what this is giving us a snapshot of is how symbiosis has generated diversity in the clownfishes. We see the importance of symbiosis at these sort of intermediate evolutionary levels, but we see that the way that they're using these hosts is correlated with their, their color pattern. And, so um, do you have any idea um, how these different hosts give rise to the different colors? It's a great because question. Because it's not the, the anemone is not that color. So it's not right. like that is a coloration that would hide it within the anemone. So we do have some hypotheses. And in fact, I just submitted a grant uh, in January to look at the adaptive function of the color pattern evolution itself. So we have some hypotheses that some of the color patterns um, or all of the color patterns actually have function. Um, in particular, the black with multiple white stripes, the fact that they live in carpet anemones, these are really short tentacles. So they can't hide in the tentacles themselves. And that is a very highly contrasting color um, and pattern. And what this basically leads to this hypothesis that it might be warning coloration so that the, the fish might be evolving a warning coloration, basically saying, hey, I live in a toxic host. Don't come near me. And, and so these are the ones that are the most exposed. So we think that what, that might be what's going on for the ones that are black and white. Um, for these other species, their hosts have long tentacles and they can dive right in and disappear. So they can visually evade predators and they don't need to maybe maintain this strong signal. So maybe what you're seeing is the evolution just sort of removing the signal altogether because they don't need to maintain mm -hmm. it. Um, so again, lots of complexity there that you can obviously talk about for hours on end. But. So do you have kind of a, um, an, a main message that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, so the sea anemone hosts are solving the clownfish radiation. So we, there's been lots and lots of work, you know, done sequencing these fish and looking at the morphology and the preferences and the behaviors of the fish, but the anemones have largely been overlooked. And when we are talking about a symbiosis, it's really important that we account for the whole symbiosis. And, you know, no matter how good your data are, you can have full genomes. If you're not accounting for the entire complexity of the interaction, you're probably not going to be able to solve it. So the C. anemone hosts in this particular case are kind of disentangling the, the whole mystery of the, the radiation itself. So this is really exciting. This is all ongoing and unpublished at this point. So we're going to start knocking some papers out. But um, yeah. Well, That's thanks for uh, talking with us this morning. Yeah. My That's, pleasure. Um, uh, interesting uh, information there. So, uh, a lot to take in. It is. And a lot left to uh, learn and, and research. It is. And, you know, we, we see Finding Nemo and, you know, there's a whole hidden layer <laughs> of Finding Nemo that, uh, you know, the movie just sort of glosses over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah.